There we are. Hello. Um, welcome to Sacred Space, Religion and Cosmic Exploration. I'm Lance Garabi. I'm going to vamp for a little as people are filtering in and we're going to go around and, and have folks say where they're, where they're calling in from. Uh, Lance Garabi, I'm calling in from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm Mary Jane Rubenstein, and I am calling in from Middletown, Connecticut. Brother Guy, where are you calling from? So, though I'm at the Vatican Observatory and live part of the year in Tucson, you're catching me today at the University of San Francisco. And I'm Jeff Kripal, and I'm coming from Richmond, Texas. Delightful. That's great. Uh, let's see, we've got... Folks from Massachusetts, New York, Texas, Florida, Arizona, uh, more from Texas, Columbia. Oh, oh someone saw uh, the article in the New York Times, Brother Guy. <laughs> uh, just, just to let you know, uh, uh, Brother Guy was mentioned today in the New York Times uh, in, in a good way. Uh, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, uh, MJ, shall we get started? Let's do it. Let's go. All right. We, we want to welcome you to Sacred Space, Religion, and Cosmic Exploration. This is a project of Arizona State University's Interplanetary Initiative. Once again, I'm Lance Garavi, uh, Professor of Theater at ASU and Associate Director of the Interplanetary Initiative. MJ. And I am MJ Rubenstein, Professor of Religion and Science and Society at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. I'm also co-PI of the II's Sacred Space Program. This is the third in our series of public conversations about the intersections of religion and space exploration. Uh, we're so grateful you're here. We hope you'll attend the, the fourth and final one on April 6th and help us spread the news by sharing the registration links with your friends and colleagues and networks. Um, all of these conversations are recorded and you'll be able to find links on the project's website, which I can put in the chat. Um, so throughout this series, we're delving into the, the, the past, the present and the future of the relationship between religion and space exploration and today we're we're focusing on some current and emerges emerging practices by asking how will space exploration shape religion um, now many religions are hundreds or even thousands of years old but humans have only been going to space since 1961 so what impacts has space exploration had on religions old and new? How might religions change as we start living and working on other worlds? When is the Sabbath on Mars? Where's Mecca if you're praying on the moon? In this symposium, we're discussing the ways space exploration has shaped and might continue to shape religions. Uh, to help us explore these and other questions, we've invited a pair of marvelous guests, MJ. And I'm going to introduce the marvelous guests. Uh, these are Brother Guy Consolmagno, who is a Jesuit brother and director of the Vatican Observatory. He's the author of several popular books on astronomy and the relationship between faith and science, including the hilariously entitled volume, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? In 2014, he received the Carl Sagan Medal for Excellence in Public Communication in Planetary Science. And Jeffrey Kripal is the J. Newton Razor Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University. Jeff is the author of many books, including The Superhumanities, Historical Precedents, Moral Objections, and New Realities. He is presently working on a three-volume study of paranormal currents in the sciences, modern esoteric literature, and science fiction. 
And you can read more about our speakers on our website. I'm putting that in the chat right now. Um, so you can look in there for their more detailed um, biographies. Uh, speaking of the chat in which I just posted something, um, please feel free to use it throughout our conversation to engage with one another as you're listening. If you've got ideas, if you've got links, if you've got references that you wanna put up there, please do. Um, we will be monitoring the chat to make sure that there's no nonsense going on there, um, but we won't be taking questions from the chat. If you have a question that you'd like to ask our panel Panelists, please submit it through the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. Quick word about the order of things. Uh, Lance and I will be talking with the panelists until about 7.50 Eastern Standard Time, at which point we will turn to the questions that you've all submitted through the Q&A. So again, you can do that at any time as our panelists are talking. Um, our panelists will address those questions that you've given them for about 20 minutes, and then we'll be sure to wrap up at 8.15. So that's that. Let's go, Lance. Let's do it. Let's do this. Uh, so uh, the question that's that's organizing this conversation is how will space exploration reshape religion? Uh, for both of you, what's the first thing that comes into your mind uh, when you hear this question? Uh, Brother Guy, would you like to start us out? Well, the one thing that immediately I thought of when I heard this was <coughs> a phrase that... Uh, a fellow astronomer at the Vatican Observatory once said, are we making God big enough? When you begin to understand the immensity of the universe, you can either be overwhelmed and terrified and you don't want to look, or you can be so astonished that in this enormous universe that uh, God can still notice me. There was... Uh, <clears throat> An example that I like to give, I, I give retreats, and, and one of the things I do is just show a series of images of the surface of Mars. Now, Mars isn't the universe. Mars is just the planet next door. And yet, for people to suddenly realize that Mars is a place, a place that robots are moving on right now, that someday people are going to walk on, shifts their sense of who they are and, and who, how big the universe is. And I think, especially in a religion that is a, a creation-oriented religion, like the, the people of the book, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, where we attribute to God the creation of the universe, the bigger the universe, the bigger God must be. Uh, Jeff, how do you respond to that question? Um, with the word up. Uh, that's that's my answer up. Um, you know, I think first of all, I, I I gave a lecture once on this very question. We had the 50th anniversary of NASA uh, that was hosted at my university, Rice University. Um, our football field is where JFK gave his famous shoot to the moon or go to the moon address. So it's the only thing famous that ever happened in our <laughs> football stadium, by the way. Um, and. I was asked to speak to this 50th anniversary event about the effects of space exploration on the religious imagination. And what I said was the same thing I'll say here. I think for millennia, human beings were basically locked on a two dimensional surface of the earth. And so transcendence was always this third dimension. It was, it was always up. And we still see that today in near death experiences and all kinds of religious art where the assumption is that transcendence is up. But with space exploration, of course, there is no up. Uh, and, and we've been up, we've been up there and there's, there's, no, there's no heaven up there. And so I think that's a tremendous challenge. And I think what you see in the modern world, going back at least to the 19th century where this cosmology began to shift is you begin to get new imaginations of what transcendence is. And those move into, frankly, hyperdimensionality with the rise of geometry and mathematics. And those also move into evolutionary biology with a sense of, of evolution in a kind of teleological or, or directed way. Um, so I, I think space exploration has been profoundly influential. Um, but I don't think any of these changes are are um, are integrated into into our our, our public our public understanding. 
I, I would throw as an analogy to that because I think that's that's brilliant. You know, the way that light and dark was has been used in uh, religious imagery, assuming that nighttime is dark, and it isn't anymore. We've got electric lights. We've got light pollution. Um, we all know the phrase, it was a dark and stormy night. When was the last time you were in a stormy night and it was dark out? Stormy nights are brightly lit now. And it means that the imagery that we use, the metaphors we use to try to explain the transcendent experience um, aren't working the way they used to. There, If I could add to that, I mean, the, so I taught I, my early career was all thinking about human sexuality and religion. And, you know, if you look at almost all religious traditions, they had an agricultural model of human sexuality. They thought the man planted the seed in the, the, the field of the woman. And therefore, the essence of the person was, of course, in the seed it was in the male. And that then generated a whole set of values and a whole set of patriarchal and, and um, notions about maleness and, and femaleness. And well, we know that's just wrong. I mean, look, we know there are chromosomes and it's a 23-23 kind of even split. And we know, we know all kinds of things about genetics now, but that has not filtered down into our religious imagination about what gender and sexuality is. And I think the same is true with this notion of up and transcendence. It just I mean, I see this in a lot of my my own experiencers or materials, this notion of transcendent shifting, but I don't see it in, in the religions themselves. So if, if I can follow up on this, what do you think would have to, to happen with our experiences of space or of science or, uh, or new knowledge or, or, or what have you in order for it to have the kind of impact that you say hasn't occurred yet in, in order to integrate this conceptually, metaphorically, narratively perhaps in, in uh, religions? I mean, would it, would it be a certain percentage of the population moves off earth? Would it be some sort of new knowledge or new just a really awesome movie or what? What What is it going to take? <laughs> Brother Guy, do you want me to try or do you want to go on? Yeah, yo, yo, no, I, I'm happily letting you go first okay. so, I can look, I, so I can look wise by comparison. Yeah, <laughs> well, okay, a couple things. Um, and and I'll, I'll tell some stories here. Um, my first introduction to astronomy was in a Catholic seminary. And I remember standing out in the freezing cold, looking through a telescope at a globular cluster with a Benedictine monk who was my astronomy teacher. And it freaking blew my mind. Okay, it just blew up my mind. Um, and But I had never been exposed to that uh, as a young man, nor was I ever exposed again to that. So there was an integration of astronomy and and theology and religion in this this very sophisticated seminary, but there just isn't uh, in the public culture or or in in the Catholicism that that I you know returned to after the seminary. So I I think that's a real problem. Um, I also think, and I'll throw this on the table because I think this is going to come up. I think the notion of space is potentially unifying. Um, because it's it's beyond all of our religions and all of our cultures and civilizations. It's what we all share. Um, so, you know, it usually gets coded in science fiction as some kind of invasion, which is a problem, but it unifies the species. And I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that if there is a serious engagement with other life forms that are non-terrestrial, that could really shift how we see human culture and human civilization. Um, so I think that it, it could be handled positively or negatively, depending on how our, our thought leaders and our religious leaders respond to it. Part of what we need are metaphors that everybody has experienced and they can recognize. And the culture is changing so rapidly and so disparately in different parts of the world, in different parts even of our own nation, that at the moment we're kind of short on uniform paradigm. Uh, 
metaphors. <laughs> we have we have none. I mean, <laughs> and not I just short. Sure. So the, the, you know, what you're saying about you know the great movie um, is not as foolish as it sounds. We're also in the sort of thing you know. I'm <laughs> old enough to remember a world before Star Wars. Yeah, but most, but you know, that's there are fewer and fewer of us who were uh, have that experience of seeing the world change. And I think and certainly in my generation, there is a, a sense of rootlessness because the things we assumed when we were kids, we now know weren't true and that's fine. But the things that we do have in common are a lot fewer than we thought they would be and things that we thought would always be there aren't, including the stars. You know, you can't see the stars anymore. Great, and I, I, I appreciate that the that my comment wasn't as foolish as it sounded. Uh, I was I was uh, talking about <laughs> when I said movie, uh, it was the shorthand for some sort of narrative uh, or or vision uh, or or impactful experience. Uh, any, anyway, uh, this is terrific, MJ. Yeah. So to get us, so this is um, I really like Jeff what you said about how. Um, space has this sort of unifying possibility and that may be where we're going. Of course, it may not be at all. Where, who knows where we're going? Um, in order to get a sense of where we're going, I wonder if we can talk a little about where we've where we've been so far um, since, you know, the late 50s, the early 60s. Um, can I ask Brother Guy first? Um, this phenomenon of humans going to space again is relatively new. The Roman Catholic tradition is 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 older than that. Um, but have there been ways that uh, space exploration, human space exploration, has already reshaped um, either not necessarily Catholic doctrine, but Catholic understandings of its own doctrine? Or are there are there ways that uh, the, the church has been affected by by these developments over the last few decades? Sadly, I would have to say no. Mm -hmm. I think it's the sort of thing that takes a really long time. Uh, the best thing you can do is to look at how long it took for our understanding of who we are to be shaped by recognizing that there's suddenly a continent of human beings that we had never encountered before. Right. And that took hundreds of years for it to uh, alter the way that we understood ourselves and the way we understood our languages and our religions, including a lot of fights that, you know, the echoes are still there today. Do we bring Western religion? Or do we adopt, you know, the Chinese rites into Catholic religion? Mm -hmm. um, and the arguments are not so simple either way. And I think the the unifying sense of space will come when space is something that everyone has an experience of, and we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to happen, but I think it's still way too soon. Mm -hmm. And the fun thing is to watch it happen as it's happening. Mm -hmm. That's fun. I, I'm thinking about, um, you know, St. Augustine's uh, uh, refutation of the possibility of Antipodeans in the city of God. He's yeah. like, there can't possibly be people living right. on the other side of the globe. After all, Jesus only came up here. He didn't come down right. there and he would have had to come down. Right. And and looking, I mean, and it seemed so unassailable. And then looking at it from our perspective, it seems absurd to have, and I, I'm back to your opening statement, which is the question of whether we're making God too small. It seems absurd at this point to say <laughs> that God couldn't mm -hmm. possibly be the God, like, that that kind of monotheistic God couldn't possibly be the God of the whole earth. But you need a whole earth perspective and we don't have that kind of uh, analog to a whole earth like a whole space perspective or a whole galaxy or even a whole solar system perspective mm -hmm. um jeff what about you so i mean i so i know this this is going to be a different answer right um the, the the question for for your um your neck of the woods is how um human space exploration has produced not so much changed existing traditions but has produced new religious movements um what are we seeing what have we seen since the late 50s when you know we started getting artificial things up in the sky um, what are what are you seeing in in new religious movements? <clears throat> a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that that we I hope we talk about a lot in the study of religion is revelation, and by that I mean people having experiences that they do not construct or make up; they receive them. Their, their, their receptions of truth or experience that come from outside the person. It doesn't mean they're true to the scholar, of course, or, or to the historian, but it means that the person's not 
is being very sincere and honest when they describe these experiences happening. And certainly what you've seen from the 19, well, 1940, June 24th, 1947 actually is the date. Um, you have an entire UFO mythology developing, you know, during the Cold War, and it takes on a pretty um, violent Cold War narrative. The, the alien is invading from outside the space of the nation state, which is identified with, with our religion. And, you know, you have to fight off this alien threat. And, and the language of threat, by the way, is still used in the halls of Congress and in the military. And we haven't, people have had, I think hundreds of thousands, if not millions of experiences of some kind of discarnate entity or some kind of object in the sky. And they've framed those in that Cold War narrative, in that merit mythology, because that's what they know, right? And to go back to the Star Wars movie, I, Brother Guy, I remember when Star Wars came out, but it's freaking Star Wars, <laughs> right? I mean, it's the darn, it's that violent, you know, macho narrative again. And and I know like the movie that came out right before that, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I know the man who consulted on it and Spielberg did not follow his advice. You know, it's very faithful to people's experiences of, of balls of light or, or objects in the sky until the, the, the famous landing scene on, on Devil's, Devil's Mountain. And then it's just pure Hollywood. So, you, you know, you, you can get these narratives and they're building and they're still with us, but I think they're they're very much indebted to this Cold War, you know, us versus them. And it's what I worry about, MJ. You know, you know me well. I mean, it's I really worry about this because it's forming public policy, it's forming military budgets, it's forming, I mean, it's it's in our head of our politicians in, in Washington, DC at this very day. So it's a problem. I think it's and, and they're not considering the religious elements which are absolutely obvious to anyone who's trained to look for religious or theological elements. Can you keep yeah. going there? What, what, oh, sorry, go ahead, oh. brother guy. Well, I mean, no, no, I, I wanna hear him go a little bit more. I've got a, a point to go back to my original, but I, I, I'd like to follow what he's going in. Well, yeah, what are the religious elements? Uh, uh, and I'd like to see you talk uh, specifically about the, 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 the non-aggression, the non-Cold War, uh, uh, Star Wars kind of, kind of element but rather I, I know there's a in the in the history of of humans relationship to to mars and belief in uh that there might be life there uh that goes back to the idea that there's canals on mars uh mm -hmm. the idea was often that these are angelic like beings that they are more advanced and they are friendly uh can you talk a little bit about the, the non-confrontational, the non-warlike aspects. Yeah, let me let me talk about movies first, Lance. I because I think I think it's easier. Um, we'll take H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Okay, about eighteen ninety nine. It's a it's a British colonial novel. Wells is reading about the British Army just massacring uh, uh, communities in New Guinea, and he wants to imagine what. An invasion would look like in the United Kingdom or in, in, in England that's a similar kind of overwhelming military force. And so he writes War of the Worlds, and that really sets this, this narrative. It, it's, it's not a Cold War narrative there. It's just a it's just a it's a colonial narrative, though. And things don't go well, by the way, when one life form meets another. We you can talk to anthropologists or post-colonial theorists, it's not a pretty picture. It's not good generally. And so that novel, I think, sets that very colonial or colonizing violent narrative in place. It doesn't really start changing until the last, frankly, the last 10 years. I mean, Close Encounters of the Third Kind gets wiped off the map culturally by Star Wars. You know, no kid grows up playing with Close Encounters of the Third Kind toys. They grow up playing with Star Wars, all right? But when you get to a movie like Arrival, and I like talking about Arrival because it totally breaks with this Cold War narrative. The, the military's there, the military, but it stands down. And 
the physicist, the male physicist does not figure out the code. It's actually a, a female linguist who exposes herself to the alien presence physically by taking her suit off and she learns the language of the alien presence. And it turns out that the language is about the circularity of, of time. And the whole movie is organized around her pre massive precognitive ability to remember her daughter's own death who hasn't been born yet. And if you, if you remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind, it was all about precognition too, the whole thing. It, the whole thing's about, so when I say there are these religious dimensions, I mean things like precognitive abilities. I mean things like, you know, um, beings in the, in the bedroom or, or doing things to people. I mean, I mean, kind of classic demonological and angelological um, uh, phenomena that we're really familiar with from history, but we're not familiar with in the modern world. And so we're left, frankly, stupid. I, I think our culture is spiritually stupid. One of the things that uh, does come out of the post-war era, along with the UFOs, which is you know primarily an American phenomenon, you just don't talk about them quite the same way in Europe. The, <clears throat> certainly not in Africa, but I lived there for a few years. But one of the things that does come is this sense that change is not only possible, but for about twenty years there was a feeling it could be embraced. And the climax was <clears throat> going into space. You know, by the time we actually went to the moon, we had been soured on a whole lot of change. But in the 1950s, uh, Sputnik was both a military threat, but also a promise of a brave new world. And to go back to my original answer, I'm wondering if that sense of change that was so crystallized by the space program wasn't one of the things that gave the Catholic Church the courage to change radically at just that time, <clears throat> to be able to say, okay, we don't have to continue to do things the way we did in the old days. And we could embrace the possibility of change. To the, the, the interesting thing, the, the, the images that Jeff talks about remind me that my own experience talking to people who have these very strong opinions about UFOs, about aliens, about others, is they are often, not always, you don't want to be a stereotype them, but they are often people who have abandoned more traditional religions and yet are still looking for an other that can give life to their meaning. Uh, this is the old Wittgenstein problem, you know, a chair doesn't have meaning in and of itself. You need something that's not chair to give the chair meaning. Our lives cannot create meaning within themselves, we need some reference outside of our lives, whether it's a supernatural being, whether it's an alien from outer space, whether it's a, a person other than me that I can fall in love with, but it has to be an other that gives meaning to myself. And space is now a new place where we can look for these others. Great. Um, so, Brother Guy, what is the role of the Vatican astronomer? What sorts of exploratory programs does the church endorse? And are there any it opposes in terms of space exploration? Um, when I arrived at the observatory 30 years ago, the boss then looked me in the eye and he said, this is your job, do good science. And if you've ever tried living off of a NASA grant, you realize what a radical uh, <clears throat> gift that is. Because before I was, a, you know, didn't enter the Jesuits until I was nearly 40. I'd lived off NASA for 20 years. You can only do the science that NASA has decided is worth paying for. And you'd better have a project that's going to get your results in three years, or you're not going to get renewed. Instead, the work that we can do is long-term uh, survey work, uh, looking at lots of galaxies in lots of places that will take 10 years. In my case, it was measuring physical properties of meteorites. That took me 15 years to, you know, just get the first data set. When I first presented it at a meeting, I was told, you know, guy, why are you doing that? Nobody does that. It's because 
well, nobody else had the access to the media arts or that kind of time. Now, the only thing that I think ought to be and, and would be forbidden is any activity that you shouldn't do in any event. I shouldn't be stealing somebody else's data. I shouldn't be lying about my results. I shouldn't be, you know, murdering my rival so that he doesn't get my crap, whatever. <clears throat> In, in all of the inventiveness of the human race, uh, nobody's ever managed to invent a new sin. But specifically, insofar as space exploration mm -hmm. is a different sort of endeavor than astronomy, um, uh, is, is there, uh, I guess, let me frame this another way. How, how does the church frame the endeavor of space exploration specifically uh or or yeah. is there a a, a a catholic understanding of that endeavor <clears throat> there there certainly isn't a top-down version because you got to remember there's what a billion catholics in the world and the vatican where i work is about the size of a large high school you know there's less than a thousand people there uh, and the old yeah. joe comedy people work at the vatican about half so there's even fewer <laughs> doing things there. But to give you a sense, um, I can think of three times when popes have specifically talked to astronauts. And the first, maybe the most notable, when uh, Pope Paul VI uh, was in our observatory in the dome of the Schmidt telescope, speaking to the Apollo 11 astronauts on the moon, the day of the moon landing. And all he did was to say, bless you, Bless the work you're doing and recognize that you are bringing humanity, for better or worse, off of the earth and into the larger realm of the universe. And uh, the same way both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis have had moments when, you know, they've spoken to astronauts in the, the space station, the ISS. And again, it's not, you know, telling them do this, don't do that. It's just rather saying, remember that you're representing all of us. And in some ways, we get to vicariously live through your experiences. So that's a very specific way, uh, not of saying do this, don't do that, but a, a very specific way of framing that activity of being an astronaut, of leaving the Earth. You're representing all of us. Would you? Yeah. And yeah. so far as not very many people get to do it, it's going to be the case. The issue is when everybody can fly to America, then, you know, being someone who can fly to America is no longer such a special thing. That changes the whole mentality of what it means to fly around the world. Okay. All right, Jeff, I want to take us back to some UFOs for a minute. <laughs> UFOs. <laughs> back to UFOs. Are there, so your your you you your your answer previously to the question about um, the way that uh, the way that space exploration, both literally and imaginatively, right, have begun to produce these new religious movements. You said there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff. Um, can you tell us a bit about um, what tend to be the trends in UFO encounters and these um, experiences that folks have um, and what it is that's religious about them? Like how, how does, I mean, my sense from your work is that um, you're not only saying, look, there's this thing called religion that we, this category called religion that we can apply to UFO encounters, but also <laughs> that UFO encounters, encounters with the paranormal are reshaping our understanding of what counts as religion and what, how do they, how do they do that for us? Yeah. So I think, I think, now let's talk, if I can talk about the broader culture, I think there's two ways to think about this subject, and I think they're both mistaken. Um, one is you begin, you sort of look to the past, and you assume a kind of scientific presentism. We, we've got it all figured out. These are, these are ancient astronauts that these dummies in these previous cultures didn't realize and we can like reread the whole history of religions as like space exploration by ancient astronauts that was misperceived and fantasized as religion by primitive peoples. Okay, I think that's deeply arrogant and deeply mistaken. 
I think the opposite move is to assume the truth of a particular religion uh, that arose in the past and to read it forward into the UFO phenomena. So, you know, these, these experiences confirm the truths of some form of Christianity or some form of Islam or some form of Buddhism or whatever it is. I think that's equally mistaken. I, th I think what's actually happening when you talk to experiencers is that they are in what John Mack called ontological shock. They, they are just blown away by the physical reality, but how that reality does not fit into any model they have, any religious model, any scientific model, any cultural model. And so that's what I'm trying to say is that there's something happening to these people that the religious paradigm doesn't really work but neither, frankly, does the scientific paradigm. Uh, and there's something else going on that is far stranger and far weirder. And that's what we got to sit with. Um, because I think that's what the experiences are saying. And I, I, it's, that's, it's not Jeff speaking. I, I'm trying to ventriloquize what the experiencer is saying. Um, and so that's what my work is about, is sitting with that people who study the UFO phenomena seriously will often land on statements like, this is a demonology, UFOlogy is demonology. So that's where the old religious language works better for them than these are spaceships in the sky. And, and I think that's, that's a slight advance, but only a slight advance, because I worry about any kind of demonization um, for, because of what it entails. But some, sometimes people will fall back on an older religious paradigm Sometimes they'll fall into a, a present scientific paradigm, but I don't think either of those work. And that's why when people ask me what UFOs are, I say, I have no idea. And, and I'm not being clever or mysterious. I, I'm being honest. I think people who say they know what they are are just ignorant, frankly, or mistaken or misinformed or something. Can you keep... Can you give us an example of like a kind of story that, and, and so we can understand how it's not quite working in traditional religious frameworks and how it's not quite working in scientific frameworks? Yeah. So let's, so this, a lot of this story broke in December of 2017 and it broke in the New York Times. And there were three journalists, Helen Cooper, an African American Pentagon correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, Ralph Blumenthal, uh, award-winning journalist who used to write about Oklahoma City bombing and turned to this phenomena, and Leslie Kane, uh, another journalist who, who has been writing a lot about UFOs before that. And they broke this story in the New York Times, and they published a series of videos, a series of radar videos that were taken in the cones of, of fighter jets. Um, off the coast, and they, they clearly showed some kind of spinning object that these, these fighter jets were trying to pursue. And they were reporting on the secret government program that had taken place in the first decade of, the, of, this, of this century. We've had lots of conversations in the halls of Congress and in the military about UFOs and Air Force pilots and Navy pilots. And it's always coined in a kind of technological language. These are threats in the sky. These are things that show up on radar. Presumably, we should shoot them down. You know, I think that's the assumption. But if you actually look at the study that was done, and of course you can't, because uh, it's all classified, that's th that's the first problem we run into. Is is there's just walls of secrecy here, and any any serious researcher knows as soon as you hit a wall of secrecy, something's up. You know, it's something's fishy. But we know that those programs also produced a lot of studies of paranormal phenomena, things like plasmic orbs that presumably gave people cancer or what's called the hitchhiker effect, where a researcher would go into a, a haunted area and then bring the haunting back to the home, even thousands of miles away. So none of that gets talked about, MJ, none of it. It's just all threats in the sky and machines in the sky. And we're looking at spaceships. And what's actually happening to witnesses is so weird, so out of the ordinary and out of our present paradigms that nobody will talk about it, you know, at least in public. People will talk about it 
on chat rooms and and in books and and essays and conferences and stuff, but it will not get talked about in the New York Times because they'll 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 edit it out. They'll just let it right out. So there's a kind of whitewashing that's going on right now around around the whole UFO phenomena. It's extremely weird. It's extremely religious in all kinds of ways, and it gets reduced down to this technological or military problem, which also is true. That, see, that's what's so weird. It's also physical, but it's also spiritual. And we don't have a way of thinking about those things at the same time. We want to split those up. And then we want to say the spiritual is just fantasy. It's not really real. Only the material or the physical is real. And I just, I think that just, that just hamstrings us. Well, you know, I, I know you study uh, esotericism. Don't we have a, a, a language and a history and some traditions to be able to talk about spiritual and technological and scientific together? We do, but it's not being used, Lance. I mean, I mean, that's why it's esoteric. I mean, it's literally secret, right? I mean, it's it's what you have not been able to say in a public format. And listen, I can only say it because I'm a professor of religion. I don't know anything to begin with. I, I have, I have no public authority. I'm not an astronomer. I'm not a physicist. I'm not a chemist. I'm a, I'm a weird, liberal professor of religion who can let him say whatever he wants. You know, and I'm joking, but I'm also really serious. There's a kind of politics of knowledge here that is really, really dramatic. When you're on the inside of it, it's very obvious. And do you think conversations like the ones that we're having here right now might be a way of disrupting that those politics of knowledge? Well, we'll see. I mean, <laughs> I, I I doubt it, frankly. <laughs> sure, I doubt it. Sure. We I, we we. We don't have enough attendees to to do that. No, and you also don't have enough. You don't have enough money, Lance. What you need is money, and I mean a lot. Okay. All right, I'll work on that. Yeah. Um. So, um, I, I'd like to to ask both of you. Um, is is there is there a religious teaching that space exploration throws into crisis or could throw into crisis? I would say that the most obvious, um, which has always been in crisis, is our understanding of original sin. And original sin is one of those things that, in that, that religious phrase, causes people's eyes to roll. But it's uh, merely the observation that human beings have a propensity to screw things up. Uh, Francis Spufford talks about this in his book, uh, Unapologetic. He's sort of a, a liberal intellectual British male in a in a an environment where being religious is not considered cool. And he is, and he's trying to explain emotionally why. And he has a phrase which I won't use <clears throat> directly, but uh, he abbreviates it and he refers to the human propensity to follow things up, shall we say. <laughs> and that's there, <clears throat> and it's real. And <laughs> It's a part of being a human being. It's a part of being the fact that if you actually are free to make a wrong choice and you never make a wrong choice, were you really free? Uh, an interesting question that uh, generally gets treated not all that well in some of our favorite science fiction stories. And I, I, I deeply love science fiction, so it's... But the other side is, the way that religion traditionally has tried to explain where would this come from depends on there being a mono species. Um, the, the, the truth behind the joke of would you baptize an ET is would an appetite and would an ET need to be baptized in that if you have intellect, if you have free will, are you going to be in a situation where you have screwed things up? You have fouled things up, and you now have to figure out how do I get out of this? But the deeper question, the deeper theological question is, how did we find ourselves in this mess in the first place? And 
I've heard, you know, I've read other theologians who basically say, we have to rethink this because we don't understand it, but then nobody's understood it for 2000 years anyway. So that's nothing all that new about that. What, Great. Uh, would you have to, go ahead. Would, well, I'm wondering, would you have to push back even farther to the Imago Dei? I mean, if particularly if, um, if we encounter beings whom we deign to think of us in some way yeah. comparable um, to having human intelligence. I mean, would, would it need to go back even farther than the doctrine of original sin? MJ, could I'm, you I'm, just unpack that term? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right, yes. The image and the, likeness of God. Being, being cre human, human <clears throat> beings being created in the image and the likeness of God from Genesis. And, and to me, I, I go back to a formula that I learned as a child, intellect and free will. So that if you know you exist, if you know if you've got self-awareness and you have the freedom to do something about it, that's really, it doesn't matter how many uh, tentacles you have beyond that. Great. You, Jeff? What do you think? I, well, I think it throws everything into, into question, MJ. I, I, I think, you know, there's this split in the, in the religious studies community about, about this question and whether some kind of future contact or or revelation would would support the religious claims or challenge them i'm very much on the challenge side i i, I think there's really serious um questions here certainly around transcendence as i spoke to earlier but also what i see so often is is a kind of demonology that gets developed to explain these encounters. And that's a very traditional religious framework. Um, it's, it's a traditional religious mistake is what you're saying. Yeah, I think it is a mistake. Um, I think some of these encounters are disturbing and even violent, um, but it's not clear. It's really not clear what our relationship is to animals, for example. I mean, I mean, I have a, a a dog. We call it a dog. I mean, it's basically a four-legged furry human being, as far as I'm concerned. And and then I go and I eat a hamburger. I mean, what? So what is our relationship to these other species? Is it violent? Is it positive? I mean, I think it's really complicated. And I think whatever this intelligence is, and it might be us, by the way. I I can well see it being some other aspect of us. Um, it's not at all clear what its relationship is to our social egos and to, to our own intentions. And I, I think that's just obvious. Um, and so we can call that a demon or call it an angel or a God or whatever, but I just think that's too easy. I think that's too easy. The other thing I'd like to point out is challenge is good. Challenge is how we advance. Challenge is how we learn something. A typical question I get a lot from, you know, being this, this MIT nerd with a collar, you know, is there ever a time when my religion says one thing and my science says another and how do I choose? Which that doesn't happen. But what does happen is that this bit of science says something different from that bit of science. And then I get excited because it means I'm about to learn something and maybe I'll get a paper out of it. In the same way, to have my easy understanding of my relationship with the transcendent challenged is fantastic because it means maybe I'll learn a little bit more about me and about that transcendent. And um, even maybe I'll learn a little bit more about me and somebody else and their relationship to the transcendent. Well, so on that, to finish up with one question from us before we turn to the questions from the audience. And audience, please, if you've got, we've got some questions coming in, they're wonderful. Um, if you've got others, please, please throw them into the Q&A um, button down at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you were to figure out how to communicate with an alien life form, you are the linguist in Arrival. Um, you have figured out how to speak that uh, tentacle circular language. Um, what what might you hope to communicate to it about our spiritual traditions and or what might you want to learn from them about theirs like do you have a, do you have a sort of fantasy scenario where you're like okay the aliens are going to come and they're going to teach us how to 
or we're going to teach them how to, <laughs> is there some kind of exchange you can imagine happening that would be productive, non-military, non-aggressive, no, no death wars? I don't know, Jeff, what do you think? You want me to try to... So you make the funny face that so you get the question first. That's the... Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I've been reading Barbara Newman. I, I don't know if you've ever read Barbara Newman. She has this amazing book called The Permeable Self. And she's a medievalist, by the way. And, you know, she makes this point, which I'd never thought of, that um, it's a theological point, actually. I, I think it's relevant here. That if, if something else possesses one, or abducts one in this case, I guess, or encounters one, they must share something. There must be some shared nature for that possession or abduction or communion or contact to take place. There has to be. Other, otherwise, there would be no way to communicate in any way. And so that contact presumes for Newman, um, God. You know, it presumes a kind of transcendent source of both the person being contacted or abducted or possessed and the possessing or abducting or communing agent. And so I, I would not presume to, to be able to teach the presence anything, MJ, but I also wouldn't presume I could understand what that presence is about except through my own imagination and culture and cognitive ability. So there would be a lot of, I guess what I'm trying to say is, and I don't mean to be humble for humility's sake, but there should be a lot of humility there about what's actually going on. Um, and, and the awareness that what we think is going on is almost certainly a human projection or, or frame of what's going on. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, Brother I Guy? Immediately, immediately went back to a poem and it's not too long, I'd like to read it, called Christ in the Universe. With this ambiguous earth, his dealings have been told us, these abide. The signal to the maid, the human birth, the lesson, and the young man crucified. But not a star of all the innumerable hosts of heaven have heard how he administered this terrestrial ball. Our race has kept their Lord's entrusted word of his earth-visiting feet. None knows the secret, cherished, perilous, the terrible, shamefast, frightened, whispered, sweet, heart-shattering secret of his way with us. No planet knows that this, our wayside planet, carrying land and wave, love and the life multiplied and pain and bliss, bears as chief treasure one forsaken grave. Nor in our little day may his devices with the heavens be guessed, his pilgrimage to thread the Milky Way, or his bestowals there be manifest. But in the eternities, Doubtless we shall compare together, hear a million alien gospels, in what guise he trod the Pleiades, the lyre, the bear. Oh, be prepared, my soul, to read the inconceivable, to scan the million forms of God those stars unroll, when in our hearts we show to them a man. The poem was by Alice Maynell, Written in 1921. It shows that these ideas are not all that modern. And yet, I think it could not have been written in quite the same way in 1821. Can, can you just say a few words about what you think the, what you pull from that? From that poem. We, what what, what we share, what I hope we share, actually is the very point Jeff was making. We share stories. We don't yeah. uh, share theology. We don't share artifacts. We share stories. And I hope story is something that uh, that any entity with which we could communicate would be able to share. But there are so many things built into stories, such as a sense of linear time, that uh, you know maybe the characters from uh, from Arrival would not be able to to appreciate in quite the same way. 
And, and it just says, it's interesting how the story arrival varies from the, the Ted Chu original uh, short story. And I, if I could just add, I mean, the fact that people have such experiences suggests strongly to me that whatever this presence is, wants to contact, wants to commune, wants to communicate something. These are, these are intentional experiences. These are not random, you know, um, accidents. So uh, presumably something can be communicated or something can be changed. I, I love that we sort of began with the discussion of narrative and we've come back to it. Uh, I think a lot, uh, I, I teach a class in, in narrative at ASU and I, and I talk about narrative as something that, pre, that, that creates connection, that creates com community, commune. Uh, and, and so I'm really moved by how we've, we've come back to this. So um, uh, let me, let's jump to some questions from the, the audience here. Uh, the, the one that jumps out that's, that's most kind of on point with what we've just been talking about is uh, for, for both, both Jeff and Brother Guy, uh, what are your favorite works of science fiction? While we're on the narrative kick. Um, do you want to go, Brother Guy, or you want me to go? Sure, yeah, because my tastes are very low. I, uh, <laughs> Mine might I be mean, low, too. I, 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 do, I do astronomy and profound for work, and I read science fiction for the fun of it. So yeah. my favorite author, I think most people who know science fiction won't even put a, a, a book so much as an author. And I was a great fan of uh, James Schmitz, this writer from the 50s and 60s. His classic book was called The Witches of Keras. But the, the, the typical theme was the guy thrown into um, a milieu way beyond his abilities who has to fake it and discovers that when push comes to shove, he can find the resources to be equal to the challenges he faces. Uh, I think it's very much, you know, comes out of the post-war, <clears throat> you're looking for heroes milieu but with a little more uh, humility than simply, I'm the hero, I'm gonna beat up people because the challenges that these guys face are in fact very different from what they expect. They're much more subtle and much more, uh, I mean, the witches that he encounters are three little kids. Who are far Jeff? more terrifying than, than you know, <laughs> So I don't, my, 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 um... Taste go back to this question. MJ asked, I and I'll, I'll explain why. So I'm a big fan of Philip K. Dick, and who was an astonishing science fiction writer, but also a profound mystic, by the way, who had a, a metaphysical opening in in March of 1974 called that he called Vallis eventually. Um, and Hollywood loves Philip K. Dick, but they won't touch Vallis. Uh, and this just goes back to my point. It's like we're we're okay if someone's, you know, a materialist, you know, or something, but we're we're just we just want to shut him down or shut her or them down if they they stray from that that narrative. And and Dick was convinced all of his early all of his novels were leading up to this experience of of this cosmic mind that that he he knew in in 1974 and. So far, we we don't have a single movie on that. Even though he wrote four novels on it, by the way. Um. So, Jeff, I'm going to keep you in the hot seat for a moment and feed you another question. But I'd really like Brother Guy to respond to this. It was directed to Jeff, but I think Brother Guy, you're going to have a, um, uh, some thoughts on this too. Um. Which the question is, uh, do you see any connections between space exploration? Um, and I, let me add here also maybe UFO encounters and traditional narratives of esoteric or mystical ascent through the heavens. Um, yes, yes, yeah. I do. Great, I, like, like, like what? <laughs> well, so if, for example, the, the Merkaba tradition in, in Kabbalah is all about riding a vehicle, you know, and the okema or the 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 spiritual vehicle and neoplatonism or you know you could go on and on here mj and 
I, I think these esoteric traditions about ascending through the heavens have everything to do with contemporary UFO experiences and, and vice versa. Um, but I'm not going, I wouldn't privilege one over the other is what I'm trying to say. I'd want to read one against the other, then the other against the other and see what we could come up with. So, but I don't, I don't think one culture had it and, and the other is approximating. I think they're both, they're both, they're all approximating. But yes, the answer is yes. What immediately comes to my mind is uh, one of the openings of the spiritual exercises in St. Ignatius, the guy who founded the Jesuits. And the whole experience of the spiritual exercises is to use your imagination, to place yourself in different times, different situations, try to imagine what would it be like? What is it like? How should, um, how might I react? This power of the imagination. But the first thing he asks the retreatant to imagine is a world where God is looking down on the world. Almost as if it's a God in a spaceship. And that for, for, for 1550, when he's coming up with this, that's a remarkable way of viewing the universe and a remarkable step of the imagination. There are also these, um, that, that's great about Ignatius. There, I'm thinking of all of those other, uh, the Christian mystic tradition of those, these sort of ladders of ascent, right? Um, mm -hmm, of, right. you know, climbing up this beginning with Pseudodionysius and we just sort of ascend these ladders of um, unsaying or unknowing, and then get sort of swept up into God. Um, and and I'm and I'm taken back to um, both of your insights toward the beginning that the the up language may need to change, right? Exactly. That, because it's not uh, space isn't up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as we were talking about um, during our first conversation with uh, Victoria Smolkin um, and Roger Lanius about uh, the, uh, the 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 first uh, cosmonaut who goes to space, and then um, and then Khrushchev says, you know, he went and he didn't see God. There was no God there. Therefore, <laughs> you know, atheist, therefore, whatever, right? Um, and uh, so, so we need we need some kind of other direction or other right other something to to account for this. Um, I don't know. St. Augustine hedged his bets, right? By saying that like the up is also in, you got to go inward to go upward. And it sounds like some of that kind of comes back mm -hmm. in some of these esoteric experiences. Fabulous. Lance, you got one for us? Uh, uh, sure. We've got several questions about encountering life uh, off the earth. Uh, we've got one that says, um, I have a weird background, went to Jesuit school and a Jesuit university, but I'm Jewish. I was always interested in, in issues of theology in general. From my humble understanding of both traditions, none of the assumptions, rituals, matters of faith or dogmas would stand the reality of life beyond planet Earth. What would happen to organized religion if or when this happens? And by this happens, I think they mean we encounter okay. life beyond Earth. Or does this question matter? And then um, a couple I'm... of people are, are asking yeah. similar versions of that. I think it was Ted Peters who did a wonderful uh, survey, well, maybe 10 years ago, of you know, how would your religion change if we encountered other creatures? And the universal answer was, whatever it is I believe in, I'll, that, that will prove that I was right all along. <laughs> and, and the fact that we haven't found the life hasn't disproved any of these people's religions. So it's... Um, we are very clever at adapting our understanding and memory of what we've always believed to new circumstances. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that wouldn't change. What really does change, I think, is the language we use, the metaphors we use. And uh, the, the brilliance of most religion is to be able to separate the reality that we know we can't put a finger on and the words, which are the best we've got now, but which are always, you know, ripe to be uh, improved upon. Can, can I ask a, a follow up? Uh, we are much more likely to uh, discover what we might call non-intelligent life, like microbial life uh, uh, off Earth before we encounter any uh, aliens we can talk to um so would 
how would that, how does the discovery say of micro, microbial life on Europa or, or uh, elsewhere, say in the solar system, does that, does that change what you were uh, describing? I'll mention that uh, with my master's thesis at MIT more than 50 years ago, that first suggested microbial life in the oceans of Europa. So obviously I'm not worried about that. <clears throat> I'd love to see it. The, um, but I'm not sure your, your premise is correct. I'm also a science advisor to the SETI Institute. If it turns out that there are civilizations far away that communicate in a way that we can at least see they're there, that would be easier to see than if there happen to be microbes on those same planets. Sure. And that's why you don't want to limit the way you look. Will we find extraterrestrial uh, communications? I think the odds are pretty small, but it would sure would be foolish if we didn't even look. So let, let me add a counter voice. I think we've already encountered extraterrestrial presence. I mean, people in the millions report these experiences, but they're just dismissed. They're not taken seriously. And it's because the, the medium of that encounter is, is the human imagination. And that encounter always gets framed in whatever whatever cultural or religious or, or myth, mythical framework. But that doesn't mean they're not contacting some other non-human or superhuman life form. They clearly are. I mean, unless they're lying, you know, and, and there are millions of these people. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. So why aren't we listening to them? Why aren't we talking to them? We just dismiss them. That, that's all. We're just, we're just slicing up reality into, into little units that we, we can pretend that, that, is, that is real. And so I'm a, that's my counter voice. I'll, st I'll stop there. So I wonder, Jeff, if this would be your answer to a question um, one of our one of our guests says, um, how can a pure materialist such as myself, somebody who thinks there's nothing supernatural, ever be convinced by a non-materialist that there's anything beyond the physical universe? And what I hear you saying is um, the reason that these stories are being dismissed is that their their mental, emotional, spiritual occurrences rather than necessarily physical ones. Well, I don't. I, I think the whole language of things being purely physical or, or spiritual is is mistaken. I, I think that's our cognitive framework, and I don't think these phenomena follow that. So I think materialism itself is is a mistake, but so is 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 complete transcendence. I think there's something else going on that's far more complicated than that. Um, I think, and I think our, our conclude what I always say is our conclusions are a function of our exclusions. We, we exclude, 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 and then we conclude and we say, oh, I can explain everything. Well, that's just because you've just taken everything off the table you can't explain. I mean, that's big deal. And I'm not impressed, you know? And so I'm just not impressed by that kind of response because it just means you've taken everything off the table that doesn't fit into your, your worldview. That's all it means. Every logical system starts with axioms. And if the axiom is that particular thing doesn't exist, then your logic is incapable of ever finding it. Uh, and so, so comparison for me, MJ, is, is the antidote to that, you know, comparing people's religious worldviews and secular worldviews and scientific worldviews, but comparing them all not just some of them, leads you to a position where you realize very keenly that all of these are, are framing the real in a particular kind of way and then pretending that that's all there is. And it's, it's just not true. It's just not true. Jeff, to follow up on that, uh, I can't remember the, the term you used, ontological terror shock. or... Ontological shock. shock. Ontological mm -hmm. shock. Um, uh, to, to describe some of these experiences uh, and that we reject them because we don't have a framework uh, or a familiar framework to, uh, to understand them. Um, is, is there a sense in which the long 
history of mystic experiences in 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 various religions and in in uh, uh, mystic traditions, esoteric traditions. Uh, is this a comparable uh, yeah. framework? Yeah, I think so. I mean, or is it so distinct? Are these stories uh, quite distinct from those other so I, stories? I I think apophatic mystical ex traditions are extremely helpful here, and by apophatic I mean deconstructive mystical traditions that take away or say away common forms of knowledge or assumptions, but there's an actual there there you know that that is being articulated. So absolutely, I, I mean, this is my answer. If I have an answer, it's go look at the apophatic mystical traditions. That, that's, your, that's, an, that's the beginning of an answer to, I think, what's going on. Um, but again, we've dismissed all that. We, 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 we've taken all that off the table, I think, at least in our public cultures. I know, I know not in our, some of our, our more elite religious traditions or esoteric traditions. So maybe is there something about the mystery of space that resonates along these lines with, with both of you, for both of you? The one thing that it does is it confronts you with the reality that the universe is bigger than the distance between me and the refrigerator. And it doesn't matter whether you're a materialist or a mystic. You right. have to deal with that reality. And how you then respond to that reality you know, depends. Yeah. That, that shows the kind of science fiction story you write. That, that goes back to my time in the seminary looking at the globular cluster, and yeah. basically yeah. blowing my mind. And then, of course, going back to the refrigerator, I'm sure. You know. <laughs> I mean, I, the, to go back to the materialism comment, I mean, really what people are doing, we can build refrigerators, therefore materialism is true. That, that's, really, that's really the argument. It's like, this works. This must be the total truth of things. It doesn't follow at all. It just, it just means we can do certain things with particular processes and laws of physics and, and nature. That's all it means. You are well, both wonderful, and I think we need to let you and our audience get on with their evenings. Lance, do you want to do you want to take us out? Get on with your evenings. Maybe take a trip to the refrigerator. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and 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 I love that we're 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 coming back in a way to where we started about uh, the how big space is. Space, as Douglas Adams said, is big. Um, so <laughs> I. <laughs> I, I, uh, I uh, let me see, where really am I big. here? It's really, really Yes, big. really, really you won't believe. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you all so much for coming. Our thanks to our distinguished guests, Brother Guy and, and Jeffrey, uh, and our sincere thanks to all of you for joining us. We hope you will also register for and attend our next session, which is in two weeks on April 6th at this same time. Our guest will be Catherine Keller, uh, the George T. Cobb Professor of Constructive Theology at Drew University, and Paul Davies, the Regents Professor and Director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University, my home. Uh, together, we're going to be discussing the question, what is the cosmic future of humanity? Dun, so dun, dun. please share the news. Yes, right? Uh, just the small questions. Uh, <laughs> so please share the, the news about this series with your friends. And until next time, we wish you peace and wonder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brother Guy, if you, you and Jeff want to stick around for just a few minutes, can we... Let's see, let me stop the recording.